If you don't think that a king or queen or emperor is legitimate, you're going to be quite unlikely to go along. And I think in our society today, if somebody showed up and said, by the way, you ought to follow me. I'm your new king. God has anointed me as your king. It seems fairly unlikely that there would be a great deal of enthusiasm for that because people have seen through the illusion surrounding royal or imperial power. So I think the same thing uh, certainly could be true if Adolf's defense agency started to arrogate to itself the power of a state. I think uh, certainly some people might well say, you know, we don't need any more states. Uh, the state's bad news and we've already, we've already seen how, uh, how bad uh, the state really can be. Any reason to fear Adolf is a reason to fear the state, obviously, and this is a nice point that the Tannehills make. Uh, the possibility that somebody like Adolf might arise is offered as an argument against anarchy, but this is sort of ironic um, because the claim, of course, uh, that Adolf would arise is just the claim that the state would arise. So if you think the state's a bad thing, uh, then uh, that's a good reason to think that Adolf is a bad thing. If you think Adolf is a bad thing, it's a good reason to think the state is a bad thing. Uh, there's something strange about saying, well, we don't want anarchy because, oh my God, the state might arise. Well, obviously, if you accept that as a bad thing, then, then there's surely a presumption in favor of seeking anarchy. Uh, further, uh, while it would be hard for a defense agency to acquire powers like those uh, Adolf wants, the, the powers of a state, it certainly would be easier for a state to do so. States already have those kinds of powers. States are already in existence. They've got lots of funds. They, there's military power. So they can both suppress domestic dissent and extend their power uh, by attacking others. Um, the Tannehills uh, go on in thinking about this challenge of order in a stateless society uh, to reflect on law. And uh, I think it's really important that they do so uh, because law is really an essential feature of any stateless society. Uh, it's interesting, I, I recently ran across a blog post, a post on uh, Will Wilkinson's blog, which suggested that uh, libertarians didn't care much about the rule of law because many libertarians were anarchists. And there's something really sort of odd about this, if you think about it. Uh, certainly, anarchists have good reason to be skeptical about state-made law, right? Uh, anarchists are opposed to the state. But law as such is a vital part of life without the state. Now, uh, this has already, I think, been implicit in discussions that uh, we've had uh, with the Tannehills about lawsuits and contractual relationships and so forth. The assumption is that indeed in a stateless society there would be law. And uh, so I think it's crucial and important that the Tannehills underscore this again. Now we can imagine uh, the emergence of law taking a variety of paths in a stateless society. So one, one option obviously is that patterns might emerge in the decisions of individual arbitrators. And aside here, uh, as with defense agencies, these individual arbitrators might be for-profit entities, they might be not-for-profit charities, uh, they might be not-for-profit co-ops, they might be volunteer entities, whatever. Patterns might emerge in their decisions. And that might be because they're uh, influenced by each other. It might just be because the same situational constraints that influence one might uh, influence another, whatever. Patterns might well emerge. Just as patterns emerged in the decisions of common law judges and led to a whole set of doctrine, doctrines in common law. Now, patterns might also emerge across arbitration agencies for much the same reason. Uh, again, uh, nothing very surprising about this. Uh, it's certainly what we see in the history of common law judging, where uh, decisions are made uh, very frequently at the level of the individual court. There's some standardization that happens courtesy of appellate courts, but in general the decisions are made at the level of the individual court, and yet patterns emerge. People pay attention to each other. Now, perhaps some defense agencies might have rulemaking functions uh, in addition to 
the uh, case-by-case uh, decisions uh, made by arbitrators. Now, if they did have these sorts of rule functions, uh, this wouldn't count as legislation in the standard sense because, of course, there would be complete right of exit. This isn't an arbitrary, majoritarian, tyrannical imposition of rules by legislation. Uh, rather, it might be the case that an individual defense agency said, uh, you know, we're going to intervene only in a case in which you follow these rules, um, something like that. Um, now, another possibility is that law just develops as a matter of convention or custom. It just comes to be the case that people in a certain environment behave in a particular way and they come to expect certain things of each other and it just comes to be the case that everybody recognizes that this is the way we do it. And we can imagine this sort of thing being particularly important as regards property rules, how certain kinds of uh, uh, common property, imagine uh, roads that uh, are owned in common by a group of people or, or waterways or whatever are handled. Now, it's also important to remember the role of specialized entities, in particular professions or associations, as well as general arbitrators, in uh, establishing uh, what would amount to law in a stateless society. So you can imagine a particular professional group saying, if you want to be a member of this group, uh, you'll need to abide by these standards. But you can also think about more comprehensive uh, religious or cultural communities with quite elaborate legal systems. So think about canon law in the Catholic Church, which covers a broad range of issues, or rabbinical law within Judaism, which is perhaps an even better example. So uh, Jewish uh, law, of course, developed largely in a situation of exile. First of all, uh, among the, uh, not first of all, but including uh, the situation uh, of the uh, uh, exiled Jewish communities in, uh, in Babylon and related areas, and so we get the Babylonian Talmud from there, uh, but also uh, Jewish communities in the ghettos of uh, Eastern Europe and so forth uh, for, uh, for you know, hundreds of years. Jewish communities, in one way or another, uh, had difficulty counting on the uh, legal systems of the wider societies in which they operated, and indeed those uh, legal systems might well often have been biased against them and uh, hostile to them, and yet uh, they were able to maintain functioning legal systems with highly developed legal doctrines, not just about narrowly, quote, religious matters, but about a whole range of commercial and interpersonal matters, about tort and contract and so forth. So it's easy to imagine that uh, the role of uh, these kinds of specialized uh, legal systems uh, in a stateless society might be uh, uh, greater and uh, more evident than it is today. Now, the Tannehills make the observation as they talk about uh, the development of legal uh, norms in a stateless society. They say, laws which are based on objective principles are merely a legal restatement of natural law and are thus unnecessary. A man can identify a natural law, they say, and he can even write it down in a textbook for other men to understand, but he cannot pass it because it already exists inescapably. And so the point here is that natural law, by which really we just mean uh, objective moral principle, is objective moral principle. It exists whether or not some particular community recognizes it or not. And I I'm sure there's something to that. That seems right. But it's important to recognize that this doesn't banish disagreement. Right? People are going to have different views of what objective moral principle requires. Okay, And uh, you know, they're going to have different views of what justice demands. And because of that, there's certainly going to be variation uh, across different legal systems. In addition, people's circumstances will be different. The actual application of fixed principles of justice in different situations will vary, I think, uh, quite dramatically given people's circumstances. 